Hey everybody, this is Rudy Sarzo and you're watching John the Ninja. Ladies and gentlemen, how you doing? It's John the Ninja live in the dojo, aka the dojang, aka the John the Ninja Studios again. How many times do I have to say how interesting mm. my life is? The individual I'm speaking with right now, I remember seeing him do an interview and I said, damn, I would really love to talk to him for various reasons. One of them, a little bit more personal to me, is because his story is such a wide range of not only mm. success, but blessings and perseverance. Let me give you a little bit of history about this individual. Number one, he is, most importantly, a refugee that has made something of his life. Him and his family immigrated to the United States in 1961, where after a trial by fire, he was indoctrinated into the culture of the United States, having come from Cuba to Florida, having lived in New Jersey, and then all around the United States. But the thing that really impacted him was seeing the Beatles on the Ed Sullivan show. After seeing them, like any other rock and roll kid, they wanted the girls, they wanted to play, they wanted to have fun. But Something particular about the music he was playing stuck with him, and he's played with all types of musicians, but what he's known for is metal and hard rock. So let me explain a little bit more now. So as he's touring, doing the club scenes, trying to find his band, trying to find his niche, he's gone so many years, he's almost 30, and he gets a moment of clarity where he makes peace with himself, he makes peace with God, and he says, you know what, Lord, you know what, universe, this is what I'm meant to do, no matter what happens, I'm going to keep playing. After making that piece a few days later, guess who calls him? Sharon Osbourne. And after that, a couple of days later, Ozzy Osbourne. Why is that? Because his friend Randy Rhodes was playing with them and he said he was the guy to call. And then from Ozzy, he rejoins his old band, Quiet Riot. And they released the first metal album to go number one in the United States on the Billboard charts. And then so many other bands. Ooh. I got flustered thinking Dio, White Snake, Blue Oyster Cult, all these great bands. But this guy, most importantly, is a musician. And his love, over 40 years of playing, has seen him through. So, ladies and gentlemen, without a shadow of a doubt, I introduce to you this legendary character, this man among men, Rudy Sarzo. Good sir. Welcome to the dojo. I am blessed. I am blessed. And uh, it's, it's funny because I, I love options, especially of my story. Because, you know, I, I live, you know, we all live our lives. We all are the, the main character in our own stories, you know, and then we have secondary characters where our family and friends, and then we have background characters. It's just like a movie. But what's really interesting, you know, one time I read about Fellini. Fellini, when he cast the background actors, they were just as important to him as the main characters in the story, you know, I would say, and then, you know, because I, I, I studied film in, in college. That was my, uh, my major in school, mass communication, uh, radio, television, motion picture, uh, studies. And, uh, and I've always, you know, that's one thing that I always noticed about Fellini, how, how interesting every single character. And now, you know, let's say I'll be watching Seinfeld, which I've seen, you know, <laughs> since day one over and over again, every night. And, and I always look, you know, when they're at the diner, when they're sitting there at the diner, I always look at the characters now because I'm so familiar with the dialogue that's going on, you know, the, uh, the, the exchange between Jerry and Kramer or whatever. But there's all these other people in the background. And I know that they're not really having a conversation. This is just like the play acting because they go, you know, they're supposed to be in the background, just, you know, and sometimes I read their lips or try to read their lips to see what they're talking about. And it's really interesting guys. Some of them are actually having conversations. Some of them were just talking gibberish and not saying anything. They just, the lips are just moving, you know? So, yeah. <laughs> so that's, you know, so in, 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 in a roundabout way, thank you so much for, for such a beautiful perception of, 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 uh, of where I, where I've been and who I am and where I'm going. I appreciate the time. It's so hard to encompass because the one thing when I first saw you was like, wow, he's done so much. And of course, you mm -hmm. did the documentary with Hired Guns, where you were talking about not just you, but other really great musicians that aren't necessarily well known, but the community, the people that are ingrained in that life know, hey, that's the guy to go to if you need the job done. Um, I loved how you, you started off talking about when you went to college because you never really get to reach that topic in these interviews. And I, I did want to ask you, 
why did you pick communications? What led you to that? Because most people would assume it's like, oh, he's just been doing music the whole time, doing the club scene and never really came up, but it actually did. One of the advice I got from my parents was, uh, you know, um, uh, music is great, but, you know, just make sure that you do not, you know, get something to back you up in case music doesn't happen. Because I was in Florida at the time, in Miami, and this is... Uh, the late 60s when I went to college in 1969 and uh, as a matter of fact in 2020 I was inducted into the my college Miami Dade Hall of Fame for mass communication you know so it all came full circle but uh, so you know they say you know learn get a degree learn a trade to have something to fall back on because when I started playing in clubs I had already trained myself playing by ear, self-taught playing music and watching other people around uh, playing, you know, in my town, people, hey, hey listen, uh, my, my, uh, the, the guys playing it around town when I was growing up in the late 60s, you were talking about Jaco Pastorius, that's one guy that I used to go and watch. Yeah. Legend too. The greatest, you know, every night. I would go down to the uh, to one of the clubs in North Miami Beach where he was playing with Wayne Cochran and the CC Riders, and uh, and then in my circuit, in my in my uh, quince añeras, because that was you know like the uh, sweet fifteens, and you know Latinos have that when the girl son turns fifteen, they throw a big party, so they would hire a couple of bands to have because this pre, pre prior to DJs, so it was like live bands and. And uh, there would be nonstop music, you know. And one of the uh, in one of the other bands that I we should be in that circuit was uh, the bass player Will Lee, who became the David Letterman band, you know, bassist, you know. And the guy was a monster. I mean, these guys were really advanced as teenagers, you know. So yeah, so that's that's how I learned watching these guys and learning on my own, listening to records and so on. So. I, my first year in college, my major was music. And I'm going, wait a minute. Uh, I'm, I'm being taught like if I did not even know anything about music here. So I, you have to go through the curriculum, you know. And and I'm and at night, I'm going on and playing in clubs and doing, you know, I'm playing. And I wasn't really learning anything new that I already did not know, you know. In, in, uh, in school. So I shifted on my next semester, then I went into mass communication, which was a bit broader, uh, having radio, television, and motion picture. At the time, uh, it would give me more opportunities, you know, to, to for a career outside of music with that knowledge. But having said that, you know, now, okay, so for, for radio, now I have my own radio show on Monsters of Rock uh, station. And on Dash Network, and uh, so I've been doing that for it's going to be three years this year that I've been doing that. Then for television, one of the things that I learned immediately, you know, like you mentioned, me playing with Ozzy, that was the first time, that was my first tour with proper lighting and proper sound. And I just walked in on stage for the first time. I realized that everything that I learned about lighting during the television course that was being implemented on stage the same thing you, you got the front you got the side fills and you got the back and so i knew already how to how to light a stage but i knew the advantage of knowing how a light how a stage is lit because i would always find the sweet spots because i knew i was not going to have a follow spot it was all going to be either on ozzy and when randy was doing the solo it would be on randy not on not on the drums not on the bass so in order to be seen also i could even see what i was playing i will always find all the sweet spots in every song how it was going to be lit because they would light it the same way every night so you just knew that on a verse from mr crowley you were going to stand here because that's what the light was going to be on and so on you know and then later on it became automated so it's even more about that you have to be on the right spot every time, you know, in the song, you know. Uh, and uh, then when it came to do uh, videos on MTV, motion picture, I knew I had already studied that. I, I was not only 
familiar with the with the uh, with the theory of making a movie, telling a story visually, but also I was very I was very comfortable in front of the camera because we spent a lot of time ourselves either behind the camera in school or in front of the camera. You know, so I learned that I learned the importance of how to present yourself, how to frame yourself in a video, your presence, everything about it, you know, so studying mass communication helped me immensely, immensely during my whole music career. That is so interesting because I've taken classes in music. I was a minor at my school. I did some communication classes, but it wasn't really media based. Mm -hmm. But I do understand what you mean. You start to catch the little nuances after you have taken those classes. How mm -hmm. did that translate? Like, uh, we're going to go back to the earlier beginnings. But when you did go back to Quiet Riot, mm -hmm. and you were, you know, get your, your bearings to play again and enjoy it, and you're with your family, your initial, like, these were the mm -hmm. guys who I really started out with when it got serious. Mm -hmm. How mm -hmm. did those lessons from being with Ozzy and having been on the finer grade of, hey, this is what a concert should be like. How did you help the rest of the team go, hey, listen, guys, you might want to do this or this should be doing that. When you're over here playing, you should do this. Like, how did you help the band in you know, your experience? Yeah, that is a really great question because I, I got to tell you, uh, everything that I learned about 96 percent, and I say 96, 95 percent, is I, I learned from Sharon and the other five as as the industry evolves, because it's not the same industry that it was 41 years ago when I first started playing with Ozzy in 1981, it has really completely changed. You know, especially on touring, touring the record industry, everything, radio, streaming, everything has completely changed. But the foundation, the core of that knowledge, is still there because all you do is you adapt to these formats. You go from terrestrial radio to streaming radio. You know, non-terrestrial. And you go from, you know, vinyl to MP3s, you just adapt. It's still the same thing. You're making music, you're recording music, how you record music today, instead of everybody being in the same room, you know, you have guys all, all over the world recording to stems, and then you send that into a mixer and puts it all together. That's how a lot of records, I make a lot of records like that, you know, sometimes, and I've gotten to a point that I'd rather do it like that, with one exception. You're not going to have the cross fading of of your of your, of the energy that comes from from your body that extends about six feet, right? You know, some some people have even further, some people have less. But if you ever look at the Beatles and you look at them, you look at them at the Cavern, you look at them on Ed Sullivan, you look at them on, in Get Back, you look at them at Shea Stadium. No matter how big the place is. They're always like this, close together. But yeah, like uh, and when you watch Get Back and they're writing songs. Now they're writing songs in this huge movie set. They're not spread out. They're like this. They're face to face with each other because what you do is you crossfade your your personal energy next to the person next to you, and and you feel that, you know, and and you resonate. And you you know you feel comfortable if you if you're not if you're not on the same frequency if you're not vibrating at the same frequency it's going to create a very uncomfortable situation and sometimes if you watch the get back uh documentary that's when you see george harrison step back and get away from that circle from that circle of creativity that's going on between john and, and george i mean john and paul and then george takes back or if there's or the opposite paul will go to the piano and get away from them and every and everything's happening here but paul is over there doing you know being creative on, on his own so they they it's they might not even realize that maybe they did because they they study under uh the maharishi transcendental meditation and i've been following the david lynch foundation john hagelin and that's why they teach transcendental meditation and and I've, been, I, and, I've, and I've come to realize that transcendental meditation equals quantum physics, quantum mechanics, going into the, the quantum field. And that's what they teach, how to reach that. And 
that's where it all comes from all the knowledge all the enlightenment this is where we come from you know we're, we're either waves or particles and then there's a consciousness that makes it our own personal consciousness and then there's a a god consciousness that we're a part of and that's where all the knowledge is and then we decide what how much knowledge and how we're going to in our perception of the knowledge that that we receive you know it's like i see you have a base behind you right mm -hmm. right okay that base right now is in a in, in particle state of particle it's material right once you start plucking the strings you create waves we've gone reverse we as artists are we have the blessings to be creative that's the most godlike state to be in creativity because that's what god does creates the expanding universe and anything within it within without i mean <laughs> it's endless right and it's that consciousness that gives us as artists and it could be visual artists too because it's all waves even if you do a painting or a, photo a photograph that's a wave that's being projected from the source whether it's paper canvas whatever music this is the same thing you experience it as vibration in your body you experience it with your hearing it resonates with you right so uh, it, it's, it's, I mean, that's the reason why I started studying quantum physics, physics, because I really, during the lockdown, I wanted to improve myself and go into areas that the, I had resources available online, if I really want to research it and go down that path. And one of them was I wanted to find the healing qualities of music, because I've been on stage and I've been in awe with somebody that I was in the bus tour bus an hour before we go into the dressing room that this individual and the music that the individual has created let's say Dio Ronnie James Dio we'll go on stage with Ronnie and everywhere he went he had a healing quality about him everywhere he went it's like people could resonate with his heart which turns out to be the most important part of our body. I thought it was the brain, but no, it's really the heart, according to the scientists that I, that I follow online. And the heart has a brain, and it disperses this energy. It all comes from here. It doesn't really come, come from your brain. Mm. The energy in your body comes from your heart. And I was in awe, because at first I, 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 I could not, you know, this is, uh, let's see, I was his last bass player. I was uh, in Dio. I, um, I started playing with Ronnie in the band Dio to, from 2004 until he passed away in 2010. So this is 12 years ago. And I got to tell you, I have never before or since, with the exception of maybe Ozzy, but Ozzy had more of a, uh, I don't know, erratic <laughs> following. You know, a little bit crazy, but it's okay, you know. Uh, then, then Ronnie had, had Ronnie had a family. Uh, all, everybody in the audience was was a family, you know. They we, 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 when we were touring Europe, I mean, a lot of the audience would follow us from city to city. We would go to their homes for barbecues and days off and things like that. So it was that he brought people together. We really did, and to stand on stage and see him to be able to like create this mass energy of of love and respect coming from the stage to the audience and back at us it, it was just amazing so you know that's just a, one one of the many examples i experienced and i know the power that music has to heal i mean this is the reason why people buy tickets and leave their homes and somehow get to a venue and experience that along with other human beings. It's and they stand together, which means that again, that energy is cross fading. You might not know that who you're standing next to you have no don't even know their name, but you both are going to feel the same love coming from that stage. I think uh, my buddy said it best. Uh, he said it's like church. Because I'm a bad Christian, but I still love the Lord and all that. And he's like, you know, atheist. But we always end up making friends with, you know, people that are opposite to us. And he said the, one of the biggest things he likes about when we go to shows is 
you know, it's a, it's a church setting. Like you said, mm -hmm. everyone, they come, they mm -hmm. have a common purpose, but there's a release. There's anguish or pain that is just, it's left at the door and yeah. everyone comes together. You spoke yeah. about energy and in other interviews, especially where you're living now, you said LA mm -hmm. is a good vibe for you, especially when you were talking to Joey Diaz, when you mm -hmm. guys were talking about good places. I had a question of what places have you been to in the world? Not so much negative energy. You can go places like there's certain places in other countries where it's like bad stuff has happened here and you still feel it. But what places have you been to that you were there and it's like, yo, this is just a good energy. And it ended up being a good show or a good experience. Um, and did that affect how you performed? Like uh, when you were talking with Joey, he was like, you know, this and that. And you go, did the size of the, the group affect how you performed? And I was curious because, you know, that's a lot of people giving energy back to you when you strike a note and you hear the roar of the crowd. So does that also play a factor? Because as musicians, I'm thinking, I don't care if it's 10,000 people. I don't care if it's one person. I'm going to go off and give it my all. But you can feel when the energy is given back. So what places have been pretty positive in that? Let's say 41 years ago, things changed for me. I had my epiphany. and But I was going back down a path based on just some pure faith, pure faith. I had no idea. I, I did not understand the sources or anything like that, right? I just knew that I have come to a place in my life that and this is before, this is what, 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 before I got the phone call, you know, to join Ozzy and I was sleeping in Kevin DeBro's floor in his, uh, in his apartment in, uh, in the Valley. And uh, it was just based on, you know, you have that feeling inside of you that it's unwavering and nothing can change it. And you're on this path. Uh, but I had no information what, where that, and what that was. And sometimes it's really good to know the source of what your faith is. I mean, I mean the source, I don't mean like reading a book and getting this information. And especially I found that the New Testament, uh, See, G, it, this, this is my perception. Jesus was trying to teach 2,000 years ago, over 2,000, a little bit over, what now science is validating. Manifestations, faith, energy, all of that. The fact that we, we can manifest anything with, you know, I was talking to somebody the other day who, who has an incredible product and I was saying, can you imagine this, what happened? You thought about this, this product, and you follow, you follow everything. And here it is, I'm holding it in my hand. It, 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 that is a pure state of manifestation. My life is a pure state of manifestation. Me being a little, some little kid from Cuba coming to the United States and embracing embracing the culture and mostly embracing rock and roll because in 1964 and you touched on this you know in the intro when i saw the beatles it wasn't just about seeing the beatles they went yes i want what they have which is the adoration of all the girls in the audience that were screaming for them i never seen that girls going ape shit you know over some some dudes you know going like wow whatever you know they could have been wrestlers if, if, if wrestlers would come on, on Ed Sullivan in 1964 and they just stood there and girls were like flexing their muscles and stuff and girls were doing that, I, that I would be, you know, I would be a wrestler now, <laughs> you know, but that's what I saw. But most important was the next day in school. When I got to, in 1963, Right before Kennedy got shot, I, my family relocated from Miami to West New York, where Joey Coco Diaz is from too. And uh, there was, I, I, coming from Havana, which was very mixed, everybody lived together. Yes, we had the Chinatown and we had the, the, uh, the textile district where, you know, most of the Jewish people that had escaped from World, World War II, Nazism, you know, in, in Europe, and they, they moved, they were mostly uh, uh, Polish, mm -hmm. 
As a matter of fact, we, my family did not call them Jewish. They called them Polacks, Polacos, los Polacos, you know. And, uh, and they were mostly with the, uh, with the fabrics. If you wanted to buy fabric, fabric, you go to a los Polacos, you know, that, that neighborhood. But, you know, it was so mixed We Chinese restaurants and this Chinese Cuban fusion food that now is very popular in the United States and all of that. So it was all mixed, you know. And then, then I got to New Jersey, and which is urban. When I was living in Miami, it was not urban. When I got to New Jersey, it was urban. And just like I was living in Havana, it was, it was an urban environment for me, you know, have the middle of Havana. And so I'm again in an urban environment, West New York, and I see separation. I see like, wow, the Irish live in this few blocks and then you got Germans and you got Italians and you know, all these ethnicities. And in school, the kids, it's the same thing. The Irish hung out with themselves and the, uh, the Italians and whatever. The next day after the Beatles, it'll change now you have like and and the and the code to tell that you got it was that you went from combing your hair back you know like a pompadour to all of a sudden you got the bangs <laughs> that was the code oh you saw the beatles like so you start talking to it. and all of a sudden now music music is what we have in common and we start going to each other's house, learning about each other, playing together, and, and being friends. And we didn't have that right before that night. You know what's beautiful? I have a DJ I've worked with. He's been in Philadelphia over 40 years. But when I interviewed him, he mentioned how pivotal the Beatles were in helping the psyche of America yeah. after Kennedy's assassination. Mm -hmm. To me, mm -hmm. I'm multicultural, but I'm mostly Puerto Rican. That's what I claim. That's something that I, I've always been able to, if I got nothing else, that's what I can go to. And having been in different fields, I've been to the lowest of the low as far as work, I've pumped gas, I've done medical, I've done radio. I've seen a lot of bigotry, whether or not people know they were being, you know, hey, that's, you know, I don't think you understand why you're doing that to them. That's a trained behavior or outright. The other day I was at work and someone called someone the N word. And you're just like, really still? So being that you've been in the world of concerts and rock and you grew up at a time where it was way, I want to say way more hostile, but it was more open with how people viewed others when they looked mm -hmm. down on them for their race or ethnicity. Were there any times in your career after you became successful where you ran into someone being racist or bigot and you had to put them in place maybe it wasn't towards you maybe it was towards somebody else but you saw and it's like i can't work with you anymore or you know what man i'm gonna set you aside let me have a conversation with you i you know i no no i never really experienced that and but and so my observation since i had never played with english musicians before when i joined ozzy you know, here I am, I'm, I'm from Cuba, Latino, you know, with, with a thicker accent even then, you know. I wasn't even a U.S. citizen st yet. I was still, I had a green card. And one of the, in, in 1981, you know, things were different when you travel. So I was able to travel without a passport outside the country on tour with, with Ozzy until in 1981, we uh we landed in germany in i believe oh uh, it was a frankfurt or hamburg yeah it, it was hamburg we landed in hamburg because that was the uh the, uh, the starting of the tour and the, this is the midst 1981 of the hijackings to take me you know like a, take me take me to cuba type of hijackings of the 80s you know mm -hmm. uh airplane hijackings and uh, so I didn't have a passport. I didn't have a visa. All I had was a re-entry permit to go back into the United States. And I, got, and there were, I, I was the last guy in line going through, uh, through, through, through customs. And all of a sudden, I'm being yelled at by the agent and a machine guns appear. And I thought, oh my God, they're gonna send me back to Cuba because you know, the only, uh, that, that's, that's my nationality on this paper, re-entry permit. It still is in my passport. It says Cuban. 
but I'm an American citizen, you know, born in Cuba, you know. So there's still a reference to that, even though I haven't been in Cuba since 1961, <laughs> you know, and I'm 71 now. So it's like over 60 years, going to be 60 years. Uh, no, yeah, it is 60 years. So, uh, oh my God. So I, I, was, I was really impressed, not only how I was embraced, by everybody from Sharon. I mean, Ozzy was staying at Sharon's family's home at the time, up in the, uh, up in the, uh, in the, the Hollywood, uh, yeah, the Beverly Hills section of Los Angeles. And I was sleeping on the floor. So once I joined the band, let's just say, just pick a bungalow and live here with us. I live with them on the on tour. I live with them off the road. I ate with them when the family ate. I was at that table. Never, ever experience any, not even a hint. Because otherwise I would have not been in the same circle. I would have not been in the same band. I'm not, you know, so forget about, you know, it's, it's like, I. It's see, when you join, the the Ozzy Sharon, you know, uh, universe. It's a very tight knit family, you know. And I gotta tell you, there I cannot I cannot think of an artist that has had more diversity in his band than Ozzy, mm -hmm. because I was followed by Randy Castillo, Mike Inez. Jakey Lee, you know, these are not white kids like myself. I'm not a white kid. Mm -hmm. We are not white kids. Robert Trujillo, Trujillo. <laughs> you know, and, you know, my mindscape scene, there might be, a, you know, one or two more, but that would have never happened if there was any racism in that circuit, beginning with me. So let's push back because you mentioned sleeping on the floor with Kevin DeBro, and you've been so fortunate to have extremely good friends. Like mm -hmm. I remember uh, you yes. said when Sharon first called you, you know, you said, hey, you know what, thank you, but I can't. And it, you said mm -hmm. it was a thing you did. I was going to ask about that later, but mm -hmm. Kevin reprimanded you right then yeah. and there. Like, Are you crazy? What yeah. the hell you can get out? And Frankie always took care of you. What yep. never really comes up that I haven't been able to find in my research yet is you and your wife uh, got together in 81 mm -hmm. and you guys are still married. Yeah. I was curious what the dynamics have been, like what struggles you guys have been through because considering the friend, the guy friends you have for mm -hmm. a marriage to survive mm -hmm. the concert musician lifestyle and for you guys to still be nurturing each other, what do you give to her that you know, hey, hon, you know, you're okay. What, what is that dynamic between you two? It starts with love, you know, you, it's, you know and, and you can attach love to any action. When, when, when I first saw her, I loved looking at her. Then I loved being in her company. And once you, you start adding that love and it turns also into respect because you can't really love some, someone if you don't respect them, you know. I mean, you might say, yeah, I get you where you're coming from and it's your life and you do whatever you want, but there's really no, no unconditional love in there, you know? And the best way I can explain it is like, if you ask me the same question regarding breathing, to me, being with my wife is just as essential to my life as, as being able to breathe. I don't think about it. I love the fact that I breathe and I respect it enough not to, you know, do something foolish that would, you know, make me ill and, not be, and choke me and kill me. So just like air, oxygen, my wife is oxygen to me. I couldn't live without her. How did you guys meet? Um, what was that story when you first saw her? It's like, hey, there's always that one shot where you got to go like, embrace her and then everything else spirals to the point where you know it just works out yeah it, it was very simple you know you have to look at the circles of course you know i'm a musician living in hollywood so it was definitely not 
at a library. <laughs> <laughs> we met at, at some party in the Hollywood Hills. But you know, they were, there was a lot of crazy stuff going on, but then again, there was a lot of good people doing crazy stuff just because it was kind of like, I guess this is what we should do because it's, this, it's a sign of the times, you know. Uh, it's not, it wasn't just the 80s. The 60s and the 70s, there's a lot of crazy stuff going on. And, and stuff that could make you crazy. Like growing up as a teenager during the draft, you know, making, taking that walk because I wanted to take that walk. I wanted to like get it over with and walk into my mailbox and open it up. Okay, there's no draft notice. Okay, <laughs> close the mailbox and just get to live another day. And, you know, there was a lot of things that happened during the 60s, late 60s, especially after music, you know, the Beatles after 64, uh, that coincided with, you, you know, live every day like there's no tomorrow, consciousness. Because I saw a lot of friends who were drafted and I never saw them again, you know, friends, teenage friends. And, you know, that puts you in a whole different frame of mind, you know. Uh, then once the, the draft was lifted, it, 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 it brought in a whole different era. Uh, people were jubilant, especially the males. They were kind of like, okay, I don't have to deal with this now with this possibility that my life is going to be terminated, <laughs> you know, without it without a choice, you had no choice, you either, you know, you had to go. And that brought in that era of excess because it became, it was a celebratory era, you know, and if you can just put, of course, disco was just more than, than the ending of the draft. It was also that liberation that, that happened, you know, disco was born, in, within the gay community, you know, and uh, and I know because growing up in Florida, you know, Florida at that time and still is, but especially at that time back in in the er, in the in the early seventies was an extension of New York City. People would like during the winter they would just you know go down and to the warmer climate, and so they brought in a lot of whatever was happening in New York. They could bring it down to South Beach, you know, floor, you know, the uh, the beach area, and and do that and carry on that same lifestyle. So disco became very popular down there, and in in Miami, and boy, that's you know, you got disco, you have booze, and then you got drugs, you know, and you know, people ask me how come I never really became excessive with anything is because I left Miami, which was the center of party town, USA, Miami, you could do anything you wanted, you know, to party 24 hours a day, right? And if you want to do the best drugs, they will be shipped right through Miami, and then they were distributed through through the country. Booze, booze is booze. Women, all these girls, especially around this time of the year, spring break, you know, all over the place. And no, I don't want, you know, yes, that's great. But I wanted to be a recording artist, a musician. I didn't want to be in a cover band, you know, playing somebody else's music that I never recorded. No, I wanted to be a recording artist and tour, be in a band, be in a band. And I couldn't do it in Miami because there was no industry for rock and roll. There's still no, still no industry for rock and roll at all. And I can give you a whole show based on, you know, on that thought. But uh, I'll drop a hint. It had to do with real estate, real estate, you know, the value of property in Miami and Jim Morrison. That's and it. the hippie community that was really growing heavily in South Florida. Okay, but anyways, uh, so talking about the, uh, you know, the, uh, the disco movement and 
so that, I, I left Florida, you know, I left the comfort of being at home, not, not having to starve or anything, just because I must make it. This is what I really want to do with my life as a musician. I want to be a professional recording artist and touring artist. You know, so the whole thing about drugs and booze and all that is like, that wasn't even secondary. It was kind of like, sometimes I would do enough just to be trusted. If, especially back in the day, I do not see it anymore. I have not seen anybody do any hard drugs in my presence in decades. Back in the 70s and 80s, that was a whole different story. That was part of kind of like your trust circle. You do it, I do it, we'll trust each other. Back, you know, back then, like that the doesn't past. exist. Yeah. yeah, especially in my circle, it, that does not exist anymore. So we're jumping years ahead now. You're back in Quiet Riot. You are leading the charge. You guys are about to go on another show before you come down to us in Vineland, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. And the one thing I really loved about this lineup, you got Jizzy, you got Alex, but John, John, mm -hmm. uh, excuse me, Johnny e. Kelly, mm -hmm. he was part of a uh, typo negative. That's another mm -hmm. really big band from the 90s. And sure. so much, you just, you're, you're a magnet for great music. Mm -hmm. And I was curious now that you guys are about to go on a very long tour, it's not going to mm -hmm. end until like next February, 2023. How have you and Johnny really gelled as far as becoming that unit for keeping the rhythm going? Because now that you're yeah. a smarter musician, now you yeah. get to play around with, I want to change this part up, but I still want to give respect to the, the piece, the way it was originally mm -hmm. done. So how's that been the back and oh. forth between you two? It's very easy to explain. I, I have been many times uh, where John and even Alex and and uh, and Jizzy are right now. Uh, I've been in that situation that I am not a founding member of a band. Let's say White Snake. I was not a founding member of White Snake. Right? You know, I was not a founding member of Dio, and so on. I'm a founding member of Quiet Riot. I was in this, and I was the second bass in, in, in the Randy Rose era, and I'm the bassist in the Metal Health era. You know, and this is what we are defining right now: the Metal Health era, which is the one that actually recorded the international uh, release of Metal Health and so on. Okay, so I do understand, and to me, the most important thing is that whenever I play with anybody else. I always brought a little bit of Choir Riot with me, or a lot. Let's say with Whitesnake, I brought a lot of Choir Riot with me, only because Coverdale, uh, Whitesnake had toured with, with Choir Riot in 1984. They were our support band. And he saw me every night, so he knew what it was all about. So I asked him when I joined the band, Whitesnake, I asked him, how do you want me to be on stage? And he says, be yourself. Okay, so, that, <laughs> see, so so I could be Rudy from Quiet Riot in Whitesnake, you know, a, a a new version, but basically with that with that spirit, you know, I play with bands like the Guess Who that I bring just the, a little bit of Quiet Riot with me because I know how much, you know, it's 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 like when when you cook, you're gonna put certain more spices on certain dishes than than in others. If you put too much too many spices on on one dish that only needs a little bit. It's gonna taste awful, you know. You're gonna ruin it, basically. And so I know enough. So in me being back in Quiet Riot, my home, I can be myself 100%. So what I always encourage everybody to do within their comfort zone, because you know, everybody that comes in, you know, let's say Johnny comes in and Alex comes in and and Jizzy come in, you know. They, they want to honor what was there before. But also, I think it's very important that they bring a, a, a certain percentage of who they really are as musicians, of their identity, you know, and we're all really working really well towards that goal. You know, uh, of to to have that be comfortable, be yourself, you know, play play like Johnny do tribute to to what Frankie played before, but have your own spirit, your own energy into it, you know, 
Jizzy, the same thing, Alex, the same thing. And uh, because otherwise, you're not really doing the service, you know, you're not paying the, 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 the tribute to who was there before you. When, anytime that I join a band, I would study what the people before me, the bassist before me uh, recorded, how they perform. I would listen to the studio uh, versions of the songs. I would listen to recent YouTube re live recordings and, uh, and, and, and see the progression of the music and how everybody changed. You know, I got to tell you, I am not the same bass player 40 years later, you know, that recorded mental health. I'm not. Nobody is. And if you pretend to be that, you're, you're being foolish. It means that you haven't grown one bit. So what's the point? What's the point of you? If you you're just playing notes. You're not growing as a musician. So I, I, I am very, I study myself. I study, say, okay, this is how you play it on the record. How could you play this song now? with who, as, as who you are as a musician today, but then pay respect to yourself, to the original intent of that time. You know, I, I look at songs as snapshots, photographs of who you are, you know, and if you're, and somebody takes a picture and you're going like this, that doesn't mean you're going to spend the rest of your life every time somebody sees you <laughs> looking like that. No. You have to present yourself as who you are and how you're feeling at the time. You know, it's art. With that said, what's the best piece of advice you've ever been given? Uh, not something that you say, but somebody said it to you one time and you went, damn, that, that resonates. And it just always pops up in your head. Oof, uh, advice, single word of advice that, uh, you know, nothing, it, it, nothing really pops in my head right now. I'm, I'm sure there's been tons of it. I, any, the best advice I've ever received has been from reading uh, spiritual books. I read the Bible every single day. I look at all the resources. Uh, sometimes, you know, I am working towards being, becoming an enlightened human. By that I mean is that most of the questions, the answers will come from within. Yes, I experienced that from, from moment to moment. Guys, that was Rudy Sarzo. Sir, thank you so much for your time. I truly appreciate it. Don't forget, check out Quiet Riot, April 2nd, Saturday in Vineland, New Jersey at the Landis Theater. Guys, you're going to love it. They're such a great band, and the venue is superb. You're going to love this opportunity. Don't miss it. See Rudy Zarzo and cry it riot. And if you want to check out Rudy, he has a book out. That book is called Off the Rails and talks about his time with Randy in Ozzy. He also has his own podcast. Guys, you got to look out for this guy. He's amazing. One of the best absolute words cannot describe how blessed and how awesome he is as far as a career and as a person. Remember what he said. He said, in order to survive in a career like this, you have to be a good person. We should all strive for that. Look at that. I got Ninja's words of wisdom for you in an interview video. So, guys, as always, check them out. I'm going to be at the show. And until next time, be smart, be mindful, and God bless you guys. Until next time, Ninja out. Baby, you listen to John the Ninja. All your ears are about to go on a vacation. John the Ninja's got what you need.